Lord, we thank you. We can come in your house and we can hear your word, Lord. We can be changed by it. Lord, that your Holy Spirit guides us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's start off with this. Since we're doing baptisms today and everything, I thought this would be appropriate. We often ask this question, and I hear it asked whenever we go out and we do stuff. You know, what does it mean to be saved? When we tell people, you got to be saved, normally they'll say, saved from what? And a lot of people like to throw all these little words out there, make it sound nice and all this. And it's like, you're saved from the wrath of God. Amen. 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 Think about it. You saved from the wrath of God. You're saved from hell. And then you hear this too, you know, people say, well, I thought God was love. How could a loving God send anyone to hell? And it's like, God doesn't send anyone to hell. Your unwillingness to depart from your sin and stay in your rebellion sends you to hell. God gave a way out. You refuse to take that way out. So then the question really is, how can a just God not send anyone to hell? So, what does it really mean to be saved? What does it really mean to be a Christian? What does it really mean to be born again? Are we to look at what we see on TV as, as, as the, I guess, the model of how Christians are supposed to be? Are we supposed to look at Christian television and say, that's what, Christ, that's what we're supposed to be, right? We're supposed to collect all this money and sit on gold thrones and drive Bentleys and have jets and sleep around on our wives and switch wives every few weeks? And then cry, oh, I have sinned. No, you got caught. Is that Christian? No. And then whenever a real Christian shows up and you live out what the Bible says, people look at you and say, you're radical. Like, you're really into this. Like, I'm not even close to being radical. I'm just doing 1% of what the Bible said. And you're called radical. Because in this country, we're so used to being, seeing everybody say, well, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. It's like, great. Even the demons believe, but at least they shudder. Most of us believe and don't care. I heard that on the street all week. Guy high like a kite. I believe I got faith. I believe I got faith. And it's like, faith in what? And yeah, you believe it. Even the demons believe. Look, even Satan himself knows that there's a God. So what does it mean to be a Christian? There's a lot of confusion about it. <coughs> because then on the other hand, you got these people that say, well, we're under grace. And you can do whatever you want and still make it. No. Then you'd have to rip out major parts of the Bible. Yeah. Exactly. Grace is not a license to sin. There are a lot of people, especially in this country, that claim to be saved, claim to be born again, but yet cannot give you the actual definition of it. Me and Matt and Amber was talking yesterday, and the guy, this guy was trying to quiz their son. He says, I know some scripture. Guess what scriptures he knows? Judge not lest ye be judged. It's like, yeah, there's a lot more that goes with that. Yeah. A lot more that goes with that. Um, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, was another one. You know, and it's like, all right, there's a lot more that goes with the Bible than just those two. And if your whole theology is based on those two, you're going to hell. Especially on the judge not part. Because I'd much rather be judged. See, this is, if you live your life open, 
and you live your life the way the, the Bible says for you to live, you can sit and say, judge me. Judge me. That's part of what the meeting after church is for. Somebody said that they was going to expose me. I'm going to expose me for what? I'm not hiding nothing. I live way too transparent. Y'all know way too much about my personal <laughs> life. I think that hinders me sometimes. Because the same way I am up here is how I am at the house. Ain't got nothing to hide. So much so that I'm going to show y'all my phone for that meeting. For all the stuff that this guy's going to expose me for. Anybody's free to look through my phone at any time, or my computer, or whatever. Tell me if that's not transparent. Speaking of, I've got to turn my phone on, so I have it. I heard it go off earlier. Breaking the rules already. So, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to have Christ? What does it mean to be born again? When you tell somebody you're born again, what does that mean? Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, I think is a good summary of it. I love the way it starts. It says, And you are dead in your trespasses and sins in which you have previously walked according to the ways of the world, according to the ruler who exercised authority over the lower heavens, the spirit now working in the disobedient, He's talking about Satan. Satan has the authority in the lower heavens. If you want to know what the lower heavens is, it is the, this earth, this age, okay, this world. And I like how it says the spirit is now working in disobedience. Or if you are disobedient to the word, you are being led by Satan. We too, I like how he says, we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires. Carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were, by nature, children under wrath as the others were also. Remember what I said, what we were saved from? Because before we were saved, we were children of wrath. Meaning, we were under the wrath of God, getting ready to get some of it. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. We sang the song. You know, if grace was an ocean, we'd all be sinking. Okay? Because none of, listen, as good as everyone in here thinks y'all, we are, ain't none of us good enough to make it to heaven. Not even on your best day. Are you good enough to make it to heaven? There's nothing you can do to make it to heaven. You just not good enough. Sorry to bust your bubble. Especially those people. Well, I'm a good person, really. By whose rod of measurement are you a good person? Are we measuring it by God's standard? And I didn't see this. God did the messenger. Together with Christ Jesus, he also raises us up seated in the heaven. Think about this. God comes to us in our worst and extends grace and extends mercy to us. And he pulls us out of the, the muck at our worst. And I hear this from a lot of people. Well, I'm going to clean up and then I'm going to go to church. It's like you'll never get good enough to come. You come in your, in your worst because God cleans you up. You can't get cleaned up on your own. You will not make it. Okay? Because if that was the case, then we wouldn't have Christmas because Jesus didn't have to come to die. Jesus didn't have to be born. See, the whole reason behind Jesus coming on Christmas and the whole reason behind Christmas is not the little baby in the manger. It's the man who died on the cross. Amen. That was just means to an end. The whole reason why we celebrate Christmas is the birth of the Messiah who would ultimately die on the cross to atone for our sins. He's not a baby in the manger anymore. I heard a funny story because they had a manger scene down Matinal Street. 
And there was no baby Jesus in it. And they were like, did somebody steal the baby Jesus? Did, you know, and Matt's like, I bet they wait till Christmas morning to put the baby in the manger. So Matt's driving Christmas Day out the, to come to church, and he's like, the baby Jesus is in the manger. They put it in the manger that morning. Amen. I said, now that's funny. That takes take some thought in it. I'm not going to put the baby in the manger until he's born. So we are saved by grace together with Christ Jesus. He also raised us up and seated us in the heavens. So that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. Like I said before, not one of us in here could do it. It's God's gift. Not from works. So that no one can boast. Because if God would have let one person go in by their own measure, that dude would be all up in heaven saying, I did this. Look at all, look what I did. And then he would have to get cast out because of all his pride. So we cannot do it. No matter how. Now listen, I had to explain this too. We do good works because we are saved, okay? Religion teaches you, hey, come see, let me use you for a second. Well, I'll tell you what, yeah, Jamie's talking, reading, come see. My lovely bride, let's just pretend she's God, okay? <laughs> this is what religion tells you to do. Religion tells you you got to work to get to the goal. You got to work. And as you work, you get closer and closer to the goal. And when you start to mess up, you get further and further away. And then you got to start working again and working again to get to this goal. That's what religion teaches. Okay? That the end is the goal, which is God. You work to get to God. What we teach in Christianity, true Christianity, is God says, hey, I loved you so much that I sent my son to die on the cross to atone for your sins. And then now that we have God, we do good works for other people. Amen. Okay? Because we already have God because there's nothing we could do to work ourselves to God. He gave it to us as a gift. Salvation is a gift. And it's wrapped up nice and pretty in a bloody mess called Jesus Christ dying on the cross. And he gives it to us. And because we have Christ, because we have God, we do good works for other people. Okay? Amen. So if any kind of religion tells you you have to work your way to God, it is wrong. It is not biblical. Okay? So what I just read in this, not from works, so that no one can boast, for we are his creation created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. Okay? So there's nothing we can do to gain God. But because we have God, we do things. Okay? Remember that next time you're saved and you mess up. Okay? We ha a lot of us have children in here. Okay? Or a lot of uh, We're all children. Somebody had to give birth to us. Not that would be very weird. For somebody. And I think you'd be a scientific anomaly. But whenever you messed up or whenever your children mess up, you don't disown them. Right? So whenever we are saved and we become children of God and we mess up, God doesn't disown us, right? What kind of schizo God would be? Multiple personality, bipolar dude would God be if Every time we mess up, he would say, okay, I don't love you anymore. Get out. See, that's what the grace is for. The grace and the mercy is he didn't give us what we deserve when we mess up. When we are his children, there's discipline, but he still loves us. We don't get disowned every time we mess up. Exactly. Thank you. 
I don't know if I could serve a God that would do that to me and abandon me and desert me every time I'd mess up because I'd, that'd be all day long. And then how would I get up to preach? About the word, because then I'd be wondering, am I, am I still saved? Am I still God's child? Because I just messed up this morning. Before I opened up my eyes this morning, I had a bunch of bad thoughts that I messed up and had to repent. So, Which brings us to water baptism. Water baptism symbolizes what I just said. It symbolizes the believer's total trust in Jesus Christ, our total reliance on Him, as well as a commitment to live obediently to Him. Remember, we do it because we have Him. We don't do it to gain Him. Okay? Water baptism is not an entrance into Christianity. Instead, we are baptized because the Lord commanded it and we want to obey Him. Okay? Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is Jesus talking. This is one of the last things he said to his, his men. So before we are baptized, we must come to believe that we are in sinners in need of salvation. We have to understand that. We have to know, okay, we all messed up and we need a Savior. Romans 3.23 says, for all, how many? All. all. We don't have to break down the Greek on that word, huh? All means every living thing on the earth, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So what does that mean? In the Greek, it's hamartia, which means failure to hit the target. You miss the mark. Sin is a failure to hit God's target. So we're like, God's target... What do you mean by that? What's God's target? It says, for all have sinned and fall short of what? The glory of God. Sin is a failure to glorify God. Romans 1, 21 and 25 says, for, the, for though they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God or show Him gratitude. Instead, their thinking became nonsense and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God delivered them over in the cravings of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and served something created instead of the Creator who is praised forever. Amen. When they knew God, they what? They did not glorify Him as God. That is sin. Sin is coming short of glorifying God. It does not mean that when we say a person is a sinner, it does not mean that they're all the same level of vile, rotten, degraded, scum of the earth, decaying sinners. Okay, because we tend to do that and say, well, I'm not a sinner. I didn't murder anybody. I don't, I don't steal. I don't. It's not that bad of a person. I never did anything really bad. It's like, but did you glorify God? Because it's a level playing field when it comes to that. Did you glorify God? Yes or no? That's what it is. And if you're a sinner without Jesus, you can't glorify God. You can have 20 dead corpses at all varying degrees of decay. But they're all still dead and they're all decaying. And so it is in human history and humankind. All are dead, but there are variances in the decay. In the decaying of, of what's left. The sin is a question of, not a question of decay ultimately, but it's a question of falling short of something. So we all understand that someone who is a thief is a sinner, right? And a rapist is a sinner. 
right? And a liar is a sinner, and so forth and so on. But sin has much more to do with what you don't do than what you do. Sin is not really an issue of what you do, but what you fail to do. You fail to hit the mark. Okay? That's why in our recovery meetings I say, I don't have to tell you not to do drugs. I don't have to tell you not to drink. I just got to introduce you to Jesus and get you into a relationship with Jesus and all this stuff falls into place. I don't have to sit there and, and concentrate on your sin and what you're doing wrong. I got to concentrate on the, on the one who can break you free of that sin. And I introduce you to the person who breaks you free of all that sin and then I don't have to worry about sin management. Charles Spurgeon, one of the great forefathers of Christianity, I love his analogy. He said, imagine that there is a pig and you're standing about 100 foot away from the pig. And on one side, you put this beautiful seven-course meal, salad, steak, all this good stuff on this side. And on this side, you put a bucket of slop. And you let the pig go. Guess where he's going? To the slop. Why? Because he is a pig. Yes. Yes. And that's all a pig knows is to eat slop. Now imagine that in the middle of that pig eating the slop, you was able to change that pig into a man instantly. In the middle of him eating the slop, change him into a man. Odds are... He's going to say, what the hell am I doing? And then he's going to go and eat the seven-course meal. Okay, right? I mean, any sane person, that's what they would do. And I wouldn't. But I got chickens, and I see some slop, and I wouldn't eat it. And pigs eat what the chickens don't, so just in case y'all... So odds are he'll lift up his head, look around, look at his environment, and say, I'm not going to do this anymore, and, chain, and, and go straight. And if he got a mouthful of slop, he'd spit it out and go and start eating the seven-course meal. Because he is no longer a pig. His appetite is no longer for the slop. His appetite is for food, for good food. Something that will give him nutrition for him to live. So that man is a new creation, right? He is no longer a pig. He is now something new. He is a man. Now, from time to time, he might have pig thoughts about the wonderful slop that he left behind. <laughs> Start thinking back, man, that slop was so wonderful. Whenever I ate it, he might even go to the slop bucket. He might smell it. He might look at it. But the moment he puts it in his mouth, what do you think will happen? He will spit it out because it is no longer good to him because he is not a pig anymore. He's a man. Even if he as a man forces himself to eat the slop, which men are able to do. Anybody tried beer for the first time? You gotta force yourself to like that. Amen. Just like smoking cigarettes, you gotta force yourself to like the smoke. That's one of those addictions that it's like, you had to force yourself to like that. You had to get through all the coughing and all that. I know I used to smoke. Whenever I talk about stuff like that, I'm not just read it in a book. I experienced it. That's why I can talk about it. I don't think I'm talking about anybody in here. Amen. Talking about myself. <laughs> Beer is just salty and like, huh. And you got to force yourself to like it. I was never a hard drinker because I couldn't get past the alcohol, the strongness of the alcohol. I didn't like that. I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't condition myself to that. But I conditioned myself to like beer and smoke cigarettes, but that's just crazy. So you can force yourself to like the slop. 
It will eventually cause you to vomit and make you sick and possibly kill you because your stomach's not made anymore to handle the slop because you are a new creation. Now, if one thinks that as a man that one day his stomach will condition himself to enjoy the slop, you're crazy. It won't. And if you think you can enjoy it day in and day out, eating the slop, it's crazy. See, if, if he is feeding upon the slop of the world and does not get sick to his stomach, maybe he was never changed into a new creation in the first place. And to this day remains a pig, even though he might look like a man, he's still a pig inside. See, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is, if, those, that little word if means a lot. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. So when we are truly converted, we can no longer enjoy the slop of the world. We can no longer stomach it. Amen. That sin that we once indulged in, we can't stand it anymore. Amen. When we entertain the sin, and we all do it from time to time, because listen, if sin wasn't fun, we wouldn't do it. If drinking beer and getting high and, and, and having sex outside of marriage and, and sleeping around wasn't fun, nobody would do it. You'd be sick to want to do that if it would hurt every time, right? Amen. We do it because it feels good to the flesh. We feed the flesh. And we all do stuff, okay? That's external sin that a lot of churches focus on. What about this one, gossip? What about unforgiveness? What about being greedy? Because those are all things that are listed in that list of that a lot of churches like to say, this stuff will keep you out of heaven, so will being greedy and unforgiveness. So we all like to entertain sin, not time. And it should make us sick with guilt and shame because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And he's working in our lives to change us from the inside out. That's what that means, changing us from the inside out meaning we can no longer stomach sin anymore. Amen. And it makes us sick whenever we eat some of it. Yeah. See, and the rite of baptism expresses the commitment of the believer to die to the old sinful way of life and to re be reborn in the newness of Christ. Hallelujah. Romans 6, 4 to 8 says, Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death. So... In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life. For if we have been joined with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him in order so that sin's dominion over the body may be abolished, so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. Since a person who has died is free from sin's claims, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Amen. Amen. So in baptism, the action of being immersed in the water symbolizes dying. Okay, It symbolizes dying and being buried with Christ. And then the action of coming up out the water is us being resurrected in the newness of life with Christ. Baptism identifies us with Christ in his death and resurrection. Portraying symbolically the whole life of the Christian as a dying to self and living for and in Christ Jesus, the one who died for us on this cross. Galatians 2.20, which was the first scripture I ever memorized. 
says, And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How awesome is that? See, Paul explains to the Galatians the process of dying to self as one in which he has been crucified with Christ. The crucifixion is not a pretty thing. There's a lot of blood and suffering. But whenever you, you hear people say, carry your cross and pick up your cross, that means pick up the instrument of death and die to your old self. See, whenever we die to self, that doesn't mean we become inactive or insensible. Dying to self means that the things of the old life were put to death, especially our sinful pig ways, and all of our old lifestyles that we once engaged in are dead to us. It makes us sick to our stomach to try to even live that again. See, Galatians 5.24 says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Where we once pursued selfish pleasures, we now pursue with equal passion the, thing that, the things that please God. And dying to self is never portrayed as something that's optional. Amen. It's not optional to die to self. That's something that, well, you can still come, but you don't have to leave your old life behind. We don't sprinkle. Who was here Wednesday night? Remember I made poo brownies for everybody? I literally took some poop in a bowl, put some brownie mix on it, and said no matter how much brownie mix I add to this poop, it's still poop. And we baked it in the back and brought it all out for everybody to try. It was just a little bit. You probably wouldn't even taste it. Nobody. It was, we didn't bring out real. I mean, it was a little Debbie Brownish. They might have had poo in it. I don't know. But it was an example to show you no matter how much you sprinkle something good over a pile of crap, it's still crap. Okay? And I could call it chocolate brownies all I wanted. It wasn't. And you see, that's what a lot of people try to do with their life. They try to sprinkle a little Jesus on their life and then call it good. But you got to totally die to that and be reborn as a new creation. And that's what baptism is all about. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 4. Now, brothers, I want to clarify for you the gospel I proclaim to you. This is the gospel. You received it and have taken your stand on it. You are also saved by it. If you hold to the message I proclaim to you, unless you believe for no purpose. For I passed on to you, as most important, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. When we turn to Jesus and we ask him to forgive our sins and to be our Lord and Savior, because a lot of people just want him to be Savior but not Lord. Save me from hell, but don't tell me what to do. He ain't tell me what to do. If you made him Lord, yes, he can. And listen, there's not one day that goes by that I sit back and I say, you know what, my old life was way better. I love that pig slop. Man, I miss that. Never. Never once that I, that ever come out of my mouth. See, Christians have been commanded to be baptized. And we should not do so out of religion, but we need to do so out of obedience. Amen. Because John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my command. Water baptism by immersion is the biblical method of baptism because it's a symbolic thing. The representation of the death, burial, and resurrection. 